This is going to be a storytelling video. You're not going to learn any practical steps for answering questions. For that, just skip ahead to the next video. Instead, I'm going to tell you the story of Bayesianism. Bayesianism isn't maths, it's philosophy. It's a way of thinking about what it means to know and to believe. Philosophers call this branch of philosophy epistemology. You may be wondering what on earth a video about epistemology is doing in the middle of a lecture course on maths and machine learning. Well, this section of the course is all about how we use our models to draw inferences about the world, and in particular it's all about how to measure how confident we should be with our answers. Philosophers have spent centuries thinking about epistemology, but by and large they don't have anything useful to say. It's only since the invention of probability theory which happened in the 1660s, that we've had the tools to really talk about belief and knowledge. This video will be about Bayesianism, which is one school of epistemology. There are lots of people who do the sorts of calculations we'll be discussing without ever thinking about the meaning and interpretation of what they're doing. But what I want to try and persuade you of in the next few videos is that Bayesianism is actually a radical philosophy and if you really take on board its articles of faith, then it will change the way you think. Let me start with a simple example, tossing a coin, the favourite example of probabilists everywhere. We looked at this in the very first section of the course. If you toss a coin, a possibly biased coin, if you toss it n times and you get a certain number of heads, your maximum likelihood estimate for the probability of heads is just the obvious fraction. Now, let's suppose we have two scientists who want to learn if this coin is indeed biased. Scientist A tosses the coin four times and gets one heads and says to themselves, the next coin will be heads with probability a quarter, i.e. 25%. And scientist B tosses the coin 12 times and gets three heads and says to themselves, the next coin will be heads with probability 3 on 12, which is 25%. OK, there's something weird going on here. Obviously, B should be more confident than A because they have more evidence. Let's say they had tossed 4 million coins and got 1 million heads. Then they should be very, very confident. Clearly, knowing a probability is not the same thing as measuring confidence. But this word confidence, where's it hiding? If you ask person A what their confidence is, maybe they'll just answer, I just told you a probability, 25% chance of heads. That's how confident I am. Here's another example. This one's from an illustration from an influential paper on adversarial attacks on neural network classifiers. Let's suppose we've got a neural network that's been trained to classify images. The authors of this paper say that the neural network, when we feed it the image on the left, gave the answer panda with 57.7% confidence. And then they invented a cunning way to create very specific noise patterns, like the picture in the middle, so that if you take the panda and you add the noise at 7% opacity, then the resulting image looks exactly the same to the human eye, but the neural network now says gibbon, 99.3% confidence. This is obviously worrying. If you're in a self-driving car and there's a speed limit sign saying 30 miles an hour, that someone has put in an adversarial attack like this, perhaps as a sticker over the speed limit sign, it could fool the car into thinking that this is a 70 mile an hour zone. So this work on adversarial attacks is lovely, but this picture shows a fundamental misunderstanding. What we saw from the coin tossing example is that probability is not the same thing as confidence. And the neural network that these authors are referring to, it was actually trained to estimate probabilities. That number, 57.7%, that's a probability. A confidence statement would look something like panda with probability 57.7% plus or minus 15 percentage points. By the way, if you want to know more about this, see section 3 of the extended notes. OK, so thinking about confidence is hard and philosophers have struggled with it for centuries, and even eminent machine learning researchers get the terminology muddled. Statistics has spent the last hundred years finding ways to talk about confidence, 
and that's what we're going to study over the next two weeks. We'll start off with one of the approaches that's been developed called Bayesianism. We've spent a lot of time on Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule is named after the Reverend Thomas Bayes from the 18th century, and it's a straightforward mathematical theorem that no one could possibly argue with. Bayesianism is something completely different. Bayesianism is the doctrine that says, if there's a belief we might hold about the world, but we're not certain about the belief, then we should represent the strength of our belief by a number in the range 0 to 1, and furthermore, we should reason about degrees of belief using the laws of probability. Bayesianism wasn't invented by Bayes, by the way. It's a school of thinking that's been around since the very dawn of probability in the 1660s, and it's associated with many names, especially Laplace. We'll come back to Bayes later, and we'll see why his name is associated with this school. Let's spell out the Bayesianist philosophy in a bit more detail. As I said, if I have a hypothesis about the world, for example, that there will be an alien contact by the year 2050, then I should attach a number to measure my degree of belief in this hypothesis. It's better to use random variables. Let's say the random variable theta is the indicator of alien contact by 2050. Theta equals 1 means they do contact us. Theta equals 0 means they don't. At this point in time, we don't know the value of theta. Well, maybe the government knows, but they're not telling. So theta is unknown. So we'll represent that lack of knowledge by a random variable. I don't know what the value of theta is. It's a random variable. But Bayesianists say that I should have a belief about theta, which I can express as a distribution for that random variable. Here, theta is a random variable taking two values, 0 to 1, so I can express my belief by telling you probability that theta equals 1. For example, I might tell you I believe probability that theta equals 1 equals 0.03. Or, in our likelihood notation, the likelihood of 1 is 0.03. The thing about using random variables is that it forces us to think about the sample space, the set of all cases that might be, and it forces us to assign a degree of belief to each of them. Random variables also make it easier to think about hypotheses where there's a continuum. For example, in that coin toss example, Let's suppose our probability model for coins is that the number of heads is a binomial random variable with parameters n, the number of tosses, and theta, the probability of heads, and that we're uncertain about theta. The Bayesianist would say, you should measure your degree of belief in any particular value little theta by using a number, and because there's a continuum of possible values of theta, I'll represent degree of belief by the likelihood for this continuous random variable big theta. Likelihoods are allowed to be larger than 1, they just have to integrate to 1 when we integrate over the entire continuum of possible values. Let's go through some illustrations of Bayesianist thinking. Here's our coin toss example again. The first article of faith for a Bayesianist is that we should represent unknown parameters by random variables, so as to capture our degree of belief for each of the possible values that it might take. Here, the unknown parameter is big theta, so that's the random variable we're interested in. The second article of faith for a Bayesianist is that our task is this, to update our beliefs in the light of evidence. This is the cornerstone of Bayesian reasoning. You start with a prior belief, you see some data, and you update your beliefs to get what's called the posterior belief. Here, I'm showing the prior belief and the posterior belief about the random variable theta by plotting its PDF. Actually, of course, there are two PDFs, one for the prior distribution and one for the posterior distribution. This person started with a prior belief that theta was uniform, and they saw one head and three tails, and they shifted their belief in favour of values of theta around one quarter. The third article of faith is that we have to have a prior belief in the first place. Bayesianists don't care at all what your prior beliefs are, but they do insist that there's only one correct way to update your beliefs. 
If you don't have prior beliefs that you can express as a probability distribution, then you're not worth speaking to because you're incapable of a rational discussion about what the evidence means for your beliefs. Which brings us to the fourth article of faith. Prior beliefs are subjective. If there are two people both looking at the same probability model, for example this bias coin, then they're perfectly entitled to whatever prior beliefs they want. They might see exactly the same data set, but because they have different prior beliefs, then they'll end up with different posterior beliefs. Here, person two at the bottom has a preconception that the probability of heads must be less than 0.6, which is expressed by saying that the likelihood is zero for any theta larger than 0.6. After seeing one head and three tails, both these people have shifted their beliefs, putting more weight on the belief that theta is somewhere around a quarter. But they started out with different prior beliefs, so they end up with different posterior beliefs. Person two had a preconception that it was flat out impossible to have theta larger than 0.6, and there is simply no amount of evidence that could persuade them otherwise. They'll definitely up update their beliefs, but only in the realm of things that they think are a priori possible. Let's look at another example. This one will bring in a bit of a computational flavour. We've spent some time in previous videos talking about Monte Carlo sampling. Here it is as it's done by Bayesianists. Here's the probability model. Let's suppose we have a collection of data points x, i, y, i, and we think they lie on a straight line, but there's noise. So we've decided to model it as y, i is a plus b times x, i plus noise for some sensible noise distribution. Now, there are two unknowns here, a and b. So as Bayesianists, we'll declare that a and b are random variables. Bayesianists always have to have prior beliefs about their unknown parameters, and a prior belief about A and B can be written as a joint likelihood function, likelihood subscript capital A capital B of values little a comma little b. Or alternatively, we can just depict the prior belief by generating a sample of AB pairs and drawing straight lines y equals A plus Bx for our sampled A and B pairs. Here I've plotted about 100 lines from 100 AB samples. The prior belief that this distribution depicts is that I'm pretty confident a priori that the slope is reasonably flat, but I'm very uncertain about the intercept. And here's the data and the simplest straight line fit you can imagine the maximum likelihood estimators for A and B. The MLE is a bit steeper than the lines we're predisposed to believe in. So let's see how we update our beliefs. Our updated beliefs are a compromise between what we believed initially and what we saw in the data. We've been persuaded by the data that there is a bit of a slope, but there's not enough data here to push us all the way toward the maximum likelihood line. OK, so this is the general mindset of a Bayesian. The crucial question to answer is, how should we be updating our beliefs? This is what we should do. The posterior belief should just be the conditional distribution of the parameters A and B, conditional on the data. Let me just repeat that. Bayesians are interested in how we update our prior beliefs in the light of data to get posterior beliefs. And the way they say to do this is simply our posterior distribution for the unknown quantity should be our prior distribution conditioned on the observed data. This is the only sane thing we could possibly do once we accept the Bayesianist article of faith that unknowns are random variables. Here's a picture that we've looked at many times already. The horizontal axis is values of the unknown parameter, let's call it parameter theta, and the vertical axis is the possible values that the observed data might take, let's call it x. And here I'm showing the joint likelihood of the two, as well as the marginal for theta. If we've observed the data, if we've seen a particular value little x, then our belief about theta should be this horizontal slice through the joint likelihood plot. 
In other words, the conditional likelihood of theta conditioned on an observed value for x. Obviously, we'll be using Bayes' rule here. That's why it's called Bayesianism, not because Bayes invented the philosophy, but because people who believe in the Bayesianist philosophy use Bayes' rule all the time. Let's go back to the example we started with. We have two scientists who tossed a coin. Scientist A tossed it four times and got one head. Scientist B tossed it 12 times and got three heads. And they both came up with the same probability estimate. The property of heads is 25%. But intuitively, scientist B has more data, so they should be more confident about their figure of 25%. And we pose the question, how should we measure confidence? Now we can see exactly how to measure confidence. The probability of heads is unknown, so we'll treat it as a random variable, and we'll use Bayes' rule to find the posterior distribution for that probability, given the data. Scientist A has little data. Scientist B on the bottom has lots of data. So their posterior distributions end up different. Both of them have posterior distributions that are concentrated around 0.25, but scientist B's distribution is more concentrated. And so the perfectly natural way to measure confidence is by measuring the width of this posterior distribution. This video has been very wordy trying to explain the philosophy. In the next two videos, we'll do some very practical hands-on Bayesianist style calculations. We'll learn how to actually compute the posterior distribution and we'll think of sensible metrics for reporting this uncertainty.